Hello everyone, welcome back to Let's Replay Bastion. Last time we met Zulf, a member of a race known as the Ura. Today we'll learn more about Zulf and his people. Uh, we'll meet some new characters and we'll continue as always rebuilding the Bastion. Off camera, I changed my loadout a little bit. We'll be playing around with the army carbine a little bit today. I'm going to try to keep swapping things around so I don't just stick with one bread and butter loadout the whole game. The fort's still standing there. Sure, the city marshals may be gone, but now the fort's crawling with windbags. This fort used to be a uh, stronghold for the city marshal. This is Cinderbrick Fort. Wham! Kids ready for the windbags this time. Oh, that's so good. Calamity was mercy. The the dynamic narration in this is so detailed and oh, so thorough. Windbags ain't so lucky. Back there, he commented on a single counterattack. There's so oh man, that's so good. Adds a lot of flavor to this. They've been left to freeze Whoa. or starve or face the kid. Uh, uh there's also the kid a heart and gift. I I didn't hit record in time. Um, but I realize there's a different pick line for every combination of weapons. Um, like, he, he has a different line of dialogue when you pick the, the fire bellows and the army carbine. As opposed to, like, if you pick the flame bellows and something else, or the army carbine and the breaker's bow. Every combination is different. There is a ridiculous amount of dialogue. Uh, so what Rux is describing is, uh, after the calamity, the windbags took refuge in the fort to stay warm. They overran it and kind of set up shop here. I'll try to get some of that pick dialogue on camera. I didn't realize it was there, so I didn't hit record uh, before I... Yeah. Oh, that's not going to do the trick. One of the idols, which makes the game more difficult, that I've invoked, uh, causes enemies to occasionally phase out of existence. Making them unattackable. Can't blame them for one, though. Though they could still attack me. Uh, so the carbine, which I've been messing around with, is a very high damage single shot rifle. Uh, it takes a little bit to reload. It takes a little bit to line up. If you hold the button down, it brings those two lines together. I'm going to try to just rush through this, because this is a big gauntlet that's uh, going to be really taxing if I try to fight through this. Uh, it brings the two lines together when you hold the button down for the carbine. And what that does is it increases the accuracy. Oh, this is... Ooh, there's a lot of rubble that is keeping me from getting through there quick. Okay. And now we just have a... Uh, a long gauntlet to go through. Or, um... An arena that we're trapped in. We have to take everything out in here. Uh, there's also another little trick to the army carbine if you hold it down halfway until it's halfway lined up you get a much stronger uh slightly less accurate shot uh so i'm gonna keep my normal tactics up of hitting and running because that's that's the way you go in uh this 10 idle run as far as i can tell damage is too high and problems compound themselves too quickly if you just stand still uh, that's the thing that makes this run actually really tricky, is the effects that you get from invoking the gods and powering up the enemies, they actually compound. Uh, like, when you get hit, you get slowed down, sometimes they phase out of existence. When they phase out of existence, they're also healing because of one of the gods you invoke. Uh, so that problem compounds itself. Uh, enemies explode on death. Or they leave behind little bombs that explode after a little while. I think they hit twice as hard. They drop fewer tonics or none at all, maybe. Yeah, the uh, uh, the scumbags especially with the heal, the, the regeneration of health, they're especially tricky. So best thing you could do: dot them up, hit and run. It's also why ranged weapons are so good for ten idol. The skyway is a welcome sight after all. He'd used to dream of getting a marshal's badge, but not like this. And now ain't nothing left for nobody down at Cinderbrick Fort. 
So we have a few more mementos to bring back to Rux and uh, Zolf now. The kid shows up just as Zolf's telling me about his own journey to the city. The marshals seem like good men, he says. They treated him with dignity. Zolf brought his antique smoking pipe all the way from the terminals. Seems the only thing the calamity saved for Zolf was his smoking pipe. Okay, let's head inside there. Can't be Whoop. too careful these days. Yeah, he, he even comments. Lapses after just one drag. He even comments when you roll off the world. And there's like four different t possible lines of dialogue he can play when you uh, roll off the, a ledge. The past. Only good thing ever come out of the past is history. This alternate little surreal dreamscape, the who knows where. This is where you learn a little bit about the lore. Uh, you can practice with different loadouts here. They're very, very long. They're like 30 waves each. Um, I might fit some of these into a bonus episode, but I'll just show this off real quick and give a summary. They unlock gradually as you go through the game. This one will reveal a little bit about the kid if you complete it. Uh, it reveals that the kid talks in his sleep and Rux overhears how much of a struggle the kid's life has been. Uh, he grew up without a dad. His mom was ill and he needed to take care of her. Uh, when he was young, he got picked on because of his Snow White hair. He quit school and volunteered to stand watch at the Rippling Walls to make his mom some money back home. Uh, the walls are where we began the game. It's kind of like this outer defense for Solandia. And then when his service is done, he goes back home and finds that his mom is gone and all the money he sent her went with her. Uh, so he goes back to the wall for another five-year shift, and then the so calamity happens. Ain't much compared to what the kids had to go through for all this. You also find out that Rox designed the Rippling Walls, and uh, we'll learn more about Rox as this goes on. I'll try to to show at least the, the beginning of all those who knows it where's takes fragments of the old world and uh, takes summarize old them. Man. It's actually a really elegant way of doing tons and tons of exposition because that's how most of the narrative is, is conveyed anyway. And the bastion makes so it all just kind of blends into the background, even though it it seems like the most on your nose in the face style of doing exposition. I don't know, they, it just, it's just nailed. Really elegant. Zolf offers to help me plot the skyways for the kid. At least the calamity hasn't touched the stars, he says. He was born in the Tazzle Terminals. The Ura sent him on a mission of peace to our city, and he's lived here ever since. Zolf doesn't touch the thing. Says the god of commotion is no children's toy. And now we have uh, this little pith monument back here. The windbags used to be all right. Then the calamity took the floor out from under them. We could always see the stars. We just never could reach them, no matter how high we built. We fought the Ura decades ago, but that was then. Things are different between us now. Even since the Ura surrendered to us, the Marshals kept a wary eye on him. The Ura feared the gods. We turned them into toys, put their faces on our walls. This is something I love, love, love. And Philip the Squirt returns, yeah. Um, I love that you get multiple perspectives uh, as Give more characters the join the Bastion and how we bring the Bastion to life as we restore it. This intricate world full of, of culture and detail. We breathe life back into it by gathering the core pieces. That's so cool. It's such a cool way to present the narrative and such a detailed, great narrative. Uh, we learned about the war with the, the aura just there. Flowed free and wild till the calamity drank it all up. We learned about the culture of the aura, that they were Maybe pious and devout. And I love that detail wings. about how the Salandians turn the gods into toys and idols where Zolf fears and worships them. That Pith, the god of commotion, is nothing to mess with, but Riverbanks they just turn it into a plush toy. They're so bent on finding the core, they hardly notice the kid. Ooh, that's a detail I've never noticed before. They are distracted, like they're not coming right after me. 
Oh, I have to destroy this and hit the switch to start the barge. This is up. Uh, Nelly. Yeah, we've been Nelly. You sent some squirts crying home and she leaves port. Maybe Nelly knows the way to the core. Maybe she can slip right past all the glamour on the coast. I swear, this game's only like or a few maybe hours, not. maybe three or four hours long. Security but they do more in those three or four hours to make the world feel vibrant no, and alive and full of history and culture. To make it feel real and believable. Than just a lot of games do with 12 or 20 or 40. It's really impressive. Can't say enough good about the narrative of this game. On top of everything else, really. Um, also, I like these slower paced sections like this where you don't have tons filling the screen because if I have one complaint about the game is that visually it's very chaotic uh, sometimes. The screen can get very busy as we saw in the last level of Cinderbrick Fort. They try to slow it uh, after replaying Transistor, it's actually become way more of a gripe to me. I love the colors, I love the beauty and the aesthetic, but it's a very busy color palette going on and a very busy uh, screen sometimes can be a little confusing visually, and that improved a lot in Transistor. Plus, the speed of the game and all the effects might make it a little hard to keep up with if you haven't played it before. It's still beautiful, and it's... Yeah, it's just a little bit of a flaw. Can be quite... chaotic on the eyes. You picked a good spot for a break. The core's right there. Oh, I can kill you through uh, the... What is this? An arsenal? Yeah. So do I want to swap out? I kind of want to mess around with the cannon, but I might save that till next episode. Very slow-moving projectile. Doesn't deflect right back at the cannon either. Or at the turret. Then the kid hears an unusual sound. Like a hundred flapping wings. Oh, right! The birds! The birds really want it. Well, kid ain't got time to think it over just yet. So yeah, we'll use some of that secret skill, the Ring of Flames. She's got a special surprise for when the waters get rough. And now that we come back to the barge, we have friendly turrets. You can tell they're friendly because one, they're not attacking us. They also have the hearts above them. I think that's kind of the same effect they use in Transistor, except in Transistor, switched enemies also turn pink. Uh, they are tremendously helpful. These turrets on the barge are helping us out. They gain all of the benefits that you get for invoking the gods. Like, they'll do more damage, they'll slow enemies down. They'll fade, yeah, like you just saw, they'll phase out of existence here and there, but they can still attack while they're phased out. They just can't be hurt. Uh, if you protect them well enough, they become uh, an asset that rides the entire barge ride. Oop, didn't quite load it up long enough. The Army Carbine is fun to use, uh, because you ride this little line of, like, how much do you want to hold the button down uh, to make it more accurate, but then if it reaches halfway, you do a power shot, and if you if it... It's kind of a neat mechanic. Uh, it's a little risk-reward system. All the weapons have, have neat little nuances like that that I love to see. I love depth uh, in mechanics when it's done that way. Uh, I think we're getting to the end of our barge ride. She's just gotta make one last stop. With the last breath, Nelly gets the kid to solid ground. Solid ground in the bigger country. Ooh, this big one does a lot of damage, but it's easy to predict. So it's easy to counterattack. As bad as a kid, kid shoes him off, knowing they'll be bad. Know how many times kid nearly fell off the barge back there? A good couple of times. Oh wow, he actually keeps track in a way. He doesn't keep like numerical yeah, track, but close. I guess I you bet sure if you don't fall off part. at all, he actually acknowledges that. This narration has done so well. Why go to Prosper Bluff? to take an enterprising man or plain old fool to venture out that far. 
The city was the most beautiful place in the world. We all knew that. But on the other hand, some folks just yearn to see the things they're told they can. Prosper Bluff is a place that, oh yeah, you saw the hallucinogenic mushroom that I just stepped on. It blurred my vision a little bit. Prosper Bluff is part of the wilds outside Salandia, and people used to venture out here to uh, to pick hallucinogenic plants. How's it go again? Oh, here it is. That's the one. Timeless. The song in the background is the most iconic theme from the song. It's called Build That Wall or uh, Zia's theme. We'll get a better listen to it later, so I don't feel so bad talking over it. Um, I will swoon and fillet this soundtrack over the course of the playthrough over and over again. You'll probably get sick of it, but I don't care. It's one of the most unique, memorable, incredible soundtracks ever. Uh, it's this barrage of disparate instruments and genres that seem like they don't belong together, but they just mesh. Man. The guy who composed the soundtrack, Darren Corp, called it uh, the genre of this game, Acoustic Frontier Trip Hop. He took these genres which fit the tone of the game in their own way, and he kind of mashed them together, and then tried to adhere to those limitations. Um, I think... I, I, and you hear these bluesy notes, there's definitely trip hop in there. It's incredible. A commentated walkthrough doesn't leave a lot of room for the music to breathe. Take my word for it. After this video, look up the playlist of the soundtrack for this game, or better yet, buy it. It is so worth every penny. One of the best ever. And it was recorded in a closet. Uh, the budget of the game was so nothing, and Darren Korb lives in this noisy Brooklyn apartment that instead of setting up uh, an expensive studio recording setup, or going to a, a studio to record, he just built it into his closet, which Mike mentioned well, in Transistor that explain what happens next. apparently that's a common thing for musicians. I had no idea about that. Suffice it to say, kid ain't coming home empty-handed. And besides, it's like the song goes. They'll be here before too long. And there's your beautiful bluesy acoustic song. Uh, that's actually going to be a recurring thing between that and the trip hop. We darn near celebrated when the kid got back, didn't we? Zolf never thought he'd see a fellow her again. We become fast friends. Calamity has that effect on people. But there was more to be done. There was one last core to find. The Bastion becomes more and more lively as we rebuild it and find survivors of the Calamity. Zia is now part of the Bastion, and we'll be getting her perspective next time. For now, thanks for watching, everyone. Take it easy. Have a good one.